Hey everyone, welcome to Write On, the podcast from Final Draft. This is the show where we talk about all things screenwriting. Today we have episode one of a two-part interview with Flatbush Misdemeanor staff writer and co-writer of Hip Hop Family Christmas, Saeed Crumpler. We're doing this? Oh, we are so doing this. This holiday season, wrap the halls with a VH1 original movie. I just like a really peaceful Christmas. Girl, I think you got the wrong family, boo. From producer Jamie Foxx, starring Carrie Hilson, Neo, Terrence J, Soraya, MC Light, and Redman. See you in church Sunday? Yeah. See you at the strip club after church. No, no. Right On's Kayla Guest chatted with Saeed about how Hip Hop Family Christmas deals with differing belief systems and family dynamics, the importance of writers helping other writers, how his music career affects his writing career, and more. Check it out. Saeed, welcome to the show. <laughs> hey, I'm back home at Final Draft. Yes. Back home at Final Draft. Saeed Crumpler, thank you for joining us. So Ooh. the last time our audience, if you will, heard from you, they may not even know, but you are the author behind the Against All Odds. You're the black man in, yeah. <laughs> in Oakland <laughs> that queried his way. <laughs> to a manager, yes. Yeah, that's how we met. So you wrote that article. Notorious and article. The, I mean, that's really where our you know professional relationship started in terms of getting to know you. And you had, I think you signed into a script chat. Yeah. With I Jeannie yeah. Bowerman. Right. Yeah, I did. That's how we connected. You were asking the most questions of anybody. I was reading the <laughs> DNA about contest season, which I'm yep. touching that subject right now. <laughs> but we yeah. got on the subject of, you know, the querying. And I just was so surprised that you had actually that was successful for you. We'll get more into that later. So you wrote that article for us. It has developed or it's evolved into kind of like a little, there's a little cult following. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, talk about that a little bit. It's kind of got like a life of its own. Like I'm always getting DM'd about it. Like people are always talking about it. I'm seeing it in other videos talking about how to get a query, you know, or like it's crazy because the amount of people that said they either got emails back from managers or signed, like we actually changed some lives with that article. And that, that also shows the power of like sharing information you know, and like not keeping it to yourself, like, you know, spreading it to help writers help writers. I think Ben Watkins said that like writers help writers. So I'm proud of that article. And so you signed with Zach and over at Bellevue and we'll get into all that later. Like we talked about. Um, first, I want to talk about your first film that released last night. Congratulations. Yeah. You know, it's funny because when we first started talking too, I said, I can't wait to have you on the podcast to talk about your, you know, your paid work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, nah, when That's you finally cool. get it, yeah. You finally nah. And you made it happen in a really short amount of time. <laughs> what was that, two years, a year and a half, maybe? So I have to tell you, because I know how much time, how many drafts you go through on your scripts. I'm going to tell you my favorite lines or references that made me laugh so hard. Number one, and you get to take responsibility for the ones that are yours, because I know it's a writing team. So number one, <laughs> my favorite was Black Christmas Matters. Yes. And this line comes out of the corporate, the suit, who's wearing the Wu-Tang <laughs> beanie. beanie. And at yeah. first, I didn't know if this was him trying to, like, make his client <laughs> feel <laughs> comfortable in his corporate off corporate white office <laughs> mm -hmm. um but then you know obviously there's a lot more to do and i just thought that was a really fun take but black christmas matters is that yours i would say yeah that, <laughs> it, it, yeah i think ding, that ding. is yeah ding ding okay um uh, my next favorite one was she's 50 years old with an only fans ding ding i think that one's mine too yeah but I just, I don't even want to think about what you're doing. Uh, 50 year with only, only fans, yeah. I mean, only I mean, fans popping. Maybe she's really good at lip syncing or something. I don't know. <laughs> you know? And then the other was, that's jealousy, referring to the look on their, or what's on their face. That's jealousy. It doesn't wipe off. Yeah, I think that was AJ who I wrote it with. Yeah, AJ I love Warden. that very much. Yeah, AJ, AJ <laughs> is dope. But what's funny also is like, when you're co-writing, like you go through so many drafts, so many polishes, we work so well together that like at the same time, it's like, I don't even remember like, yeah, I think it was maybe like, so it's like, I don't know. And, and, and to me that that's when you're writing with a partner, it should feel like that where it's like, at the end of the day, it becomes like a cohesive thing. We went so many drafts through 
changing each other's stuff. We weren't precious with anything. Like it was just like let's let's just make it better. So yeah, and that's probably why the the actual act of sitting down and writing it and the actual lines themselves don't stick because you weren't precious about it. Right. You know, yeah, Yeah. that's really helpful. Just don't give it meaning. Don't be so precious with something and it benefits you in many ways. (laughs) Yeah. Cause I feel, I feel like like laughing at your own dialogue. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Facts. And, And I think like sometimes when you're writing with somebody, you might get like, you might be like, don't change anything I have, but it's like, how are we going to get to the good like you know what i'm saying like the the purpose is to get draft through draft i think early on it should be free a free form like a dance you know like it's like Mm -hmm. to the point where it's like you don't know who's guy new yeah like any piece of art sometimes it ends up being something you didn't even intend on and it was like a a detail and ends up being the focal point of the story so to speak one parts of the story that i enjoy that I thought was done well was the different dynamics within the family, the classism, the politics. There was a lot of contra, not contradiction, conflict, Yeah, you know, within that one family alone. I mean, just from, from politics, but also who wanted to be filmed for a reality show, you know, the, the yeah. privacy. I mean, there was just so many different belief systems within one family. How did you guys come to that being in the storyline? And then, you know, how did it get to where it is now? The director, Greg Carter, had that in there. And the Tari Turner was the producer as well as one of the co-writers. Like that was something that they very clearly wanted to show. Like even though they're both successful families, they, you know, have different ways of going about it. Like one is affluent and arrogant in a sense. And it's like a Bush supporter, Republican. Mm -hmm. And and the other one just as wealthy is from the street. You know what I mean? And like and so you have these different worlds that clash together like in any marriage. You know what I'm saying? So I thought I thought it just made it more interesting. I thought that was like something that that early on they were like, this is this definitely what we want to have in the movie. Back to that point, there was the scene where we meet the mother, the matriarch of the family and we hear her voiceover, but we see a picture of <laughs> the bushes. Yep. Uh, was that a choice on your part or the production's part editing wise to just give us insight to her character? Yeah, I think that was a directing choice. Definitely in the script, it does have that you know, the wall has a, a picture of the bushes, but I, I think that was directing choice, which I thought was like dope. I got to give it to Greg Carter. It definitely like the pan from the bushes to her, but hearing her talk the whole time was a dope yeah. directing stylistic choice. Yeah. Well, you know, and there's many opinions on show, don't tell. Right. Exactly. We'll that one alone too. Yeah. <laughs> <That's really true. laughs> Just get that off the table. We're not going to talk about that. So speaking of white people, what did... <laughs> white people miss <laughs> since you didn't have to code switch writing this and what no. i really mean by that is when you're writing content for white audience really just non-black audiences i mean there's a culture there's a language between all cultures right mm-hmm. so what was that experience for you just being able to write and how did it differ at all if if at all it was great because you never got questioned about slang, you know, different certain things. You know what I'm saying? It was just like, never did it come up. Like, what is this? What is this word? Why are they saying this? Like, you never had that because it was one thing that's dope about this project is Jamie Foxx company, VH1 and MTV wanted to create the overall mission was to have like people of color writing behind the camera in front of the camera you know, people of color executives, like, you know what I'm saying? From mm-hmm. CBS, even in the no calls. So it's like, at the end of the day, it never was like dial back the authenticity or portrayal of being a person of color. It was almost like, let's go further. You know what I'm saying? Which I thought was refreshing and dope because sometimes you might get a note that's like, why did he say, you know, OnlyFans? Like, what is OnlyFans? And you got to sit and explain what OnlyFans is or, you know what I'm saying? Okay, or, well, that conversation would be fun. Or like, right, <laughs> right, but right. yeah, no, trying to get someone to understand an entire subculture is right. 
so much labor in of itself, it's lost the point, right? Lost right. the plot, so to speak. <laughs> and that was never, that that was never, ever did that ever come up. You know what I'm saying? It was almost like, yo, let's, let's be as real and authentic as possible. You know what I'm saying? And so therefore I, I appreciated that. It was like refreshing. Was there anything, a detail that you put in from your own family traditions or your own experience within the music world, obviously? Um, was there anything like specific that you can say that's from your side a lot of it really like definitely just coming from a wild family myself also like the craziness of christmas as well as some of the music a lot of the conversation between terrence J and neo i've been in those situations where somebody's asking you to sign with them you know it's like yo i need to answer soon like you know what i'm saying and, and feeling like oh shit, like I, I feel in the pressure of like, yo, I really want to do this, but I have these other things, whether it's family or relationship that's like holding you back possibly. So yeah, it definitely had a lot of, you know, my, my personal situations. And I think that's why Adria brought me in. And I feel like Adria did a great job because she's like, a humongous fan of like relationship Christmas movies where she really brought me in. Cause I really understand the hip hop, like, you know what I mean? And so to make sure I thought it was dope of her and generous of her to bring me in because it was like, yo, I know you know that world. At the end of the day, it'll make it the best project possible. And I felt like what I lacked, she gave. And, you know, likewise with Tatari and Greg, so. You kind of just gave me the segue. I don't even, you just kind of did my job for me. <laughs> Do hey. that again. Yeah. Yeah. I, well, I was going to ask you like how this all came together. Are you guys doing this project? So you explain that, you know, I, it helps us to go back a little bit and understand your first career. You had a healthy career um, already ahead of this. Talk about that. Yeah, no, I had a man. I had a full rap career. Mm -hmm. You know, the only thing that didn't happen was uh, getting a Grammy or some or you know, selling a million records, but you know, I had songs with a million plays. I had, I was in source, unsigned hype, double XL. Like I was on the radio. I was, I was what you would call like a local, you know, like a California local artist, but you know, they had like, you know, that had a real buzz. Like I feel like sometimes a lot of people be like, Oh yeah, I was in this band or I did music. But if you check my stats, it's like, Oh shit, he really did. Like, you know, I had songs with Chameleon Air, Kendrick Lamar, but uh, the transition came just because it, it, it became harder and harder to make money as an artist. I forgot who had this quote, but it was like uh, I was listening to this entrepreneur and he was like, the hardest thing to make money from right now is like being a musician because the royalties for streams are so low. And so when iTunes came, it kind of like just made it to where you could barely make money as an indie artist, where back in the day you could sell, you know, 10,000 units, six dollars a piece and be living good for a minute. And so I had to make a change, but I always loved film. And I just went back to school. Like I took $5,000, invested it in myself, took a UCA LA online writing course that I heard Stephen Canals talk about, who just followed me on Twitter. Shout out Stephen Canals. We love Stephen Canals. <laughs> awesome. Shout out Aller. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. so my mind from rap was always like invest in self. Right. So whether it was spending five thousand dollars to, you know, for a magazine ad or 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 to press up CDs to give away, I was like, I'm going to take five thousand dollars, invest in this class. And I came out of there with two specs and a uh, original pilot. And that original pilot is the one that's getting me jobs now and like got me my manager. So, you know, invest in self. But, yeah, I, I felt like I had to make a change and I, I, I chose the right one. So now that you've got a writing credit under your belt, you've been at this for a minute, actually making money doing, which by the way, is pretty fast trajectory. Um, <laughs> I've seen people <laughs> take a lot longer to break into the industry, let alone start making any money about it. So, but that comes all the way down to your business acumen, you know, in terms of the, you know, producing music and getting uh, placement. So you already understood uh, that side of entertainment industry. Now talking, I want to go back to stats because we all just went through our Spotify, you know, whatever, what are they called? Uh, I know. Yeah, I'm the artist. Uh, because I forget very simple terms. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's like your Spotify. I think it's like your playlist. That's what a year or something like that. Yes. Yeah. It's, it's all your data, people. It's all the, it's all the stuff they use to make money off you. They're sharing with you. Anyway, nice job marketing team, Spotify. Uh, so on Spotify, you had a, a money float challenge. We got to talk about that. We're going to play that uh, <laughs> first. We're going to play a little bit of the chorus. Money, money, money on 
the flow, on the flow, baby. Can I tell you something? You some pro. I'm a, I'm a throw it up and let it flow, let it flow. I'm a, I'm a throw it up, let it flow. Cash money in the air, fall slow, fall slow, baby. Can I ask you something? Drop it low. I'm a, I'm a throw it up and let it flow. I'm a, I'm a throw it up, let it flow. Talk about it. Cause it was yeah. all organic, right? Yeah, it was all organic, no radio play. And now what I usually do when I make music, which is some other artists to look into, which I, I wish I knew earlier was making music for television placement. Um, I feel like if you're an independent artist, that's the way to make money now because you can have a song that can get placed. Like Money Flow got placed on probably 50 shows. Mm -hmm. um, I just had a song placed in succession. <laughs> and so- yeah. Don't drop that and leave that there. <laughs> That's you. <laughs> and so what, what it does is like when you're an artist and you drop an album, you really only get money for like two months. You know what I'm saying? Like it's like the initial two months and then that's it. So you have all these songs sitting and it doesn't really uh, accumulate money. But the cool thing about television placement is it can get placed over and over and over and over and over again. So you consistently getting checks. But yeah, Money Flow was a song that I made uh, with my producer, T. Kelly. And it's a oh, fun, it's a fun clip. Kelly. Yeah. Oh, yeah. He, he, he did the music for the final draft. That's right. <laughs> if you're an artist out there and you're listening, like, please look into television placement. Just Google it. You actually were helping me with my neighbor. We were all going through the COVID stuff and figuring out and he lost, I think he lost his waiting job or something, but he's also a music producer. And you, yeah, I mean, you just constantly just putting people on, you say a game. Um, I won't just say it and not, <laughs> I'm not going to try to sound cool. I'm not. Nah, game, game, recognized game. That's, that's game, the recognized that's, game. game, recognized game. I try to be cool when I tweet for us on final, we all are on there. Yeah. And I, I try to say stuff like that. Like, you know, I, I think it was one of your articles and I wanted to caption it. Like Said put you on game and I would just write it back. And I was like, you look like an asshole. But you <laughs> now nah, we'll let you get away with it. You can say game recognized game. Okay. okay. I get that one only. Yeah. Okay. Game recognized I'll game. I'll leave it there. Pound. Hashtag. Hashtag. Almost Kayla. Um, <laughs> how about, let's talk about back to, you know, the music writing versus screenwriting. Uh, both are very economic versions of writing. And what I mean by that, for those that are new to the world of screenwriting that just decided today they wanted to get into it run just kidding <laughs> oh, man. but you know the, the economic writing means that you're you know being very economic with your words how many words you're putting together it's how we figure out what a log line is going to be so you obviously get more room with screenwriting so did you feel like you got to like stretch your legs a little bit out on the page yeah I feel like it was almost similar in a sense in, in storytelling Yes. And they both have rules. So like in music, you know, it's usually three verses and in between each verse is a chorus. So it's like three verses, three acts, you know what I'm saying? And so, mm -hmm. and you have three minutes to entertain somebody. So not only do you have to tell a story, but you have to entertain somebody all the way to the end. Right. Cause how many songs you heard where it's like, Oh, this is trash. You stopped like mm -hmm. after the first hook. And so it's all about keeping the listener's attention. And so when it came to screenwriting, I was like, wait a minute, there's three acts and OK, I get I understand that. And then I have OK, if it's a TV pilot, I have 32 pages or 34 pages to, you know, tell my story in this amount of time and I have to make it a page turner. Right. So like I have to keep people's attention. Yeah, it, it all made sense to me. And I also think it's the reason why I also like started finding out a lot of screenwriters were musicians. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Like, or in their past or either or still are musicians. So the creative brain is a creative brain, right? The creative brain is the creative brain. So I, I found a lot of commonalities between uh, making music and screenwriting. Would you say the, the discipline, the work ethic is comparable or completely different? Like, how would you compare, you know, finishing a song all night long in a studio to the process of finishing a deadline you have to do in the morning for pages? I would say they're both the same. But, I, but one thing I, I have to wrap my head around is movies take longer. Uh, television, like screenwriting takes longer. I think when you make a song, it's really about capturing emotion, getting it out as soon as possible. 
and getting feedback, right? So like mm-hmm. I, you, you could, I could record a song tonight, drop it next week and get feedback as soon as possible. I think with screenwriting, you know, even this movie, this was like a crazy situation where we had to finish a script in three weeks because they were shooting, you know, in order to release it on Christmas. So it was like everything was super on target. But most of the time you write something and it may not sell for five years, three years, or you sell something and it may not be made for two, three years. So I have to wrap my mind around like, okay. Forever in some cases, right? Like right, or forever. Take it off the market. <laughs> yeah, like, and, and, and so I think I had to wrap my mind around how do I get that immediate feedback? And so that's, that's where I tricked myself into like, oh, okay, then notes is that feedback, right? Mm-hmm. Or, you know, sending your script off and somebody hiring you because they liked your work, you know what I mean? Then, then yeah. that's some of the feedback, but yeah, it's, it's different in that aspect, feedback. So I want to talk about Coach Crump. Yeah, let's go. A little bit, but I do want to go back to feedback and notes. Cause that's, I mean, that's part of, well, that's in here. That's part of your brand. First thing I want you to talk about. I mean, I make fun of you, but I'm actually like very, res- like I very much respect your work ethic. I'm, I'm, <laughs> fun of you because I'm not capable of that whatsoever. You <laughs> love being alone with your words and that's awesome, but you're very helpful to other writers. You're always reaching back. Um, the fact that you wrote that blog and told people exactly how you got what you wanted is the complete opposite of how the, uh, industry typically works with those that finally get their break in. I mean, what was it? Six months after you signed with Zach that you wrote that? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. yeah. So talk about your work ethic a little bit. Where does that come from? Why are you so good at being good? <laughs> uh, thank you. I'll take all compliments and many more. Keep them coming. But no, I, I, I think it comes from like being an independent artist. When you're an independent artist, like we were so far away from record labels, you know, that it wasn't even an option. So it's like, okay, if that's not an option, then you have to hustle for everything you need to do. Like I I ran my own record label, like, you know what I'm saying? I was paying producers, I was doing accounting payroll. And so basically what I'm saying is, is that it was the hustle mentality of like, if I don't work, I don't eat, you know what I mean? And also if I don't work, nothing gets made, which equals I won't eat. So Mm -hmm. to me, it was like, when it came to screenwriting, it was like, okay, there's a book called Atomic Habits. Um, by James, James Clear. Clear. Yeah. <laughs> I was just, me? again, today, my teen will confirm on the way home. I was like, you're probably going to say no, but <laughs> I do have that book, Atomic Habits. If yeah. you learn about stacking and re- <laughs> Come know. on. What, one of the dopest things about that book is like having your goal, right? You have this humongous goal. Will Smith says this also where he had to build this huge wall And it looked like it was impossible. And his dad said, just do it brick by brick. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing. It's like you have this huge task of like writing a feature is 120 pages. Like, how am I going to do this? But if you just write three pages a day, right? That's that's your goal. Hold on, hold on, hold on. I'm going to (laughs) back it up for the human beings that can barely get through. You're just talking about words on the page. You're not talking about finished. Like, no, it's just you, you wrote until you had three pages because that's the rule that you set for yourself. And then you can move on or one, like, you know what I'm saying? Like, it's like, even if you write, like, let's say right now, whatever screenwriter is listening to this, they're like, they're having trouble writing the script. If you write one page a day for the next three months, four months, you'll have 120 pages. You know what I'm saying? So it's like consistency, consistency. Like who can't write one page a day? Like, let's just be realistic. Like if you're really trying to be a writer, you need to write one page a day. Like, I mean, you could write... You could write one page a day in 10 minutes. Sure, sure, you could. I'm not saying it's going to be good, right? Well, that's what I'm... Yeah, that's what I want to make clear. Well, I'm just saying, like, we are in this habit as a society of taking everything that people are literally saying for right like, yeah down. yeah but i mean every day i write every day i'm I trying write. to find a nice way to say this because <laughs> you and i are friends but like you know the public doesn't know and they're gonna be like wow let's cancel kayla guys nah. um, but you're so when you were just talking about the math of like if you do it for this or da, 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 i'm what? imagining the uh <laughs> The audience like what? The limitless like algorithms all around you because you're looking up as you're saying. (laughs) Yeah. Thanks to Saeed Crumpler for coming on the show. 
Make sure to check out part two of our interview coming soon. And as always, thanks to you, our listeners. If you liked this episode, leave us a review. And if you haven't already, subscribe to the show on Apple, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. For news about new episodes and more, like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter at Final Draft Inc. and on Instagram at Final Draft Screenwriting. This podcast was produced by Kayla Guess and co-produced by Emma Vranich. Editing is by Sean Bonnet. Music is by T. Kelly. Thanks again, everyone. Until next time, right on. Thank you.